Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. We're coming up, U.S. payrolls fall, but wages soar. We're going to talk about recruiting and talent and the future of employment with a former VP of talent at LinkedIn. Plus, Puerto Rico tells Elon Musk, we need to talk. They have high hopes that Tesla's solar power could help the island recover from massive storms. And new reports about swelling in the iPhone 8 battery. We're going to dig into this, how big this problem might actually be for Apple. But first, to our lead, the U.S. September jobs report showing payrolls declining for the first time since 2010. But it's all about the hurricane to hit the U.S. Without that, the labor market maybe didn't look so bad. Average hour earnings jumping since 2009, maybe because people with low wages didn't go to work because they couldn't, or because utility workers were getting overtime. But uh, either way, labor participation rate rising to just over 63%. That's the highest since 2014. Gary Cohn talked to us about that. He's the director of National Economic Council. He spoke to Bloomberg from the White House. He said the U.S. can increase uh, this figure by luring more businesses to the country. When you lower the business tax rate on the pass-through entities, on the corporate rates, we make ourselves more competitive. We make it that businesses want to locate in the United States. When they locate in the United States, they have to hire labor. They go out and compete for labor. They hire people. But in technology, there's another set of issues when it comes to jobs. I mean, the hunt for talent and the widening skills gap in emerging fields like AI. Let's bring in Steve Cadigan, founder of IDSI Digital University, a graduate school program that teaches digitalization. Before that, he was at LinkedIn. Uh, Steve, uh, the jobs report I thought was actually really interesting. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, uh, there you are from my right shoulder. Uh, jobs report, very interesting uh, because, you know, uh, it's widely dismissed because of the hurricane effect. But you could see some long-term trends in the economy re reflected in this report. Yeah, you can. And what's going to be really interesting is to see what happens in the months ahead where the real retailers are going to go at it preparing for holiday sales. I mean, those of us that are watching jobs are really curious how the non traditionally non-traditional and non-digital businesses like the, the Gaps and the, um, the Levi's and Old Navies and so forth, how are they going to compete with Amazon during the holiday season? What kind of skills are they going to be adding and how that's going to really change the landscape in the months ahead? Yeah, uh, I'll agree with you. I think the number one negative trend, certainly, uh, that jumped out in this report is the long-term move away from retailing. Certainly, there's a move away from retailing because of the hurricane. People just weren't able to get out and shop in certain places. But that's been a trend we've been seeing for some time now. It has been. And you know, what is interesting to me, Corey, is what's not in that jobs report. This huge growth in the gig economy. I was looking at some numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and over the last 10 years, we've had over 3 million jobs added of independent contractors. These are people that are not included in the jobs report. And everyone today, all the viewers today, are being touched by the gig economy, whether you're taking a Lyft or you're taking an Uber or you're spending a weekend at an Airbnb VRBO. This, these numbers and this income isn't being reported. And it's going to be really fascinating to see how the jobs report evolves to account for this really growing gig economy. Yeah, um, uh, yeah let, me, let me point out something else that I, I think we could think we've got a chart. There's a, there's a line in the, in the labor report, and, there, and it does, it's not, there aren't a lot of uh, separate lines, but the only uh, category of jobs that has seen decreases in every one of the last six months, for example, is information. So you think, oh, geez, information, information technology, wouldn't that be great? Information technology, you think that's going to rise? No, information are people who do what I do, which is create media, which <laughs> is try to report the news. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting in this time that we're having this debate about the role of fake news and Facebook as a way, a place where people are getting information, that we see uh, the jobs for people creating media continually facing declines. Yeah, but, you know, I wouldn't say that there's a decline in new media being created, which is an interesting part of that, because everyone can publish media now through their mobile device, which is an interesting trend, right? So whilst there may not be jobs on the payroll of media creation, we can't say that there's a decline in media creation overall, right? Exactly. Well, that's my point, is that, is that the, the compression of earnings and the compression of the value <clears throat> of jobs is a concern not just when people are going from crummy, uh, from disappearing uh, manufacturing jobs to now disappearing retailing jobs, but we've also got some technology jobs that aren't really high income jobs or where there's not a lot of money to be made even when there's a lot of content to be created. 
Right, but the, the, the thing I, that's not reflected in this jobs report that I'm seeing and talking to employers all over, and in our university, ISDI University, I mean, we deal with lots of organizations that are really struggling to, hi, to find the skills in things like e-commerce and data analytics. And so this whole information um, category, if you will, is really exploding in lots of different areas. And that's why my colleagues and I founded this university is to really try to address this shortage of, of talent in this new way of doing business, this new digital economy. Yeah, well, so where are you up and running? Tell me a little bit more about the business. Yeah, so we opened the school in September. We have a live uh, class of 25 students right now who are really excited about what we're building. And we're also launching an online university this October. And what we're finding and when we talk to employers is that they're super excited to have a school that's providing students with everything from digital strategy all the way through to digital design, user experience, content, understanding social networks. And when we talk to companies, let's take, go back to the retail industry, for example. When you talk to people who want to compete against the Amazons, and what do they have, like 50,000 open jobs right now, and they're looking for a new headquarters. But when you talk to their competitive retailers right now, they want people that can help them have the skills to compete with an Amazon. And those skills are in short supply, and that's what we're really going after at ISDI. And it, it's also really interesting to me that you're starting from the sort of the notion of what employers want. Uh, as opposed to what students think they're going to want or workers think they're going to want to get to the next level. Yeah, and this is, the, this is the hard part that I get asked a lot, hey, Steve, what are the most important digital skills that I need today? And my answer to that and, and our answer to that for our students is, listen, don't you want to be equipped for the skills that you're going to need tomorrow? Because we, we know what's needed today, but we also know they're going to be different five years from now. So this concept of agility, this concept of a growth mindset is super important. And that's the approach that we take in how we uh, teach our students and, and how we uh, think about the learning process. Um, and, and finally, uh, talk to me about enrollment. What do the students look like? Just about 30 seconds. Okay, so our, our average uh, age of our students is 40 years old. We have everyone from people who are in digital marketing to people who have their own businesses to writers looking to found their own business. And w what they all share is a common desire to be relevant and to compete in this new digital landscape, which is increasingly on the internet. Like, how do I get eyeballs so that I can really re reach new customers and succeed in ways that I couldn't through traditional businesses? And they don't have to go to optometry school. That's great stuff, Steve. Steve Cadigan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve Cadigan. Uh, it's the IDSI Digital University. Cool stuff. All right, Deal News. Shares of T-Mobile climbing in Friday's session. Shares of Sprint took a leg lower. The two parties are said to be finalizing the terms of their merger, which could be announced by the end of the month, according to people familiar with the matter. Talking to us here at Bloomberg, a tie-up between Sprint and T-Mobile would cut the number of national wireless co co uh, carriers, the big ones at least, from four to three. All right, well, coming up, Bitcoin uh, making a big inroads into the big banks. Banks looking at cryptocurrency. We'll bring you the details next. And Bloomberg Technology live streaming on Twitter right now. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Amazon could be selling prescription drugs by 2019. That's according to Lee Rink Partners, who expects an announcement any time in the next year or two. Amazon sold startup drugstore.com to Walgreens. The site closed last year. Amazon was an initial investor at drugstore.com, but walked away from that business. The company refused to resp uh, respond to requests for comment. Well, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, called Bitcoin a, quote, fraud. He's not the only one. Heyman Capital founder and CIO Kyle Bass waited in a matter earlier today on Bloomberg. I think there's a digital gold rush that's gone on. I think a whole bunch of people are going to lose a lot of money, right? That, these ICOs, you're going to see a bunch of them go completely broke. There are, a bunch of them are frauds. And um, that's going to be problematic for all the people that just rushed in. Uh, and, and so I, I feel like it's a bit of a mania at the moment, but I think in the long term, it's a viable asset class. Yes, fools rush in. Well, people who are familiar with the matter tell us uh, Wall Street is moving to embrace digital currencies. Financial firms starting out exploring the blockchain technologies underlying Bitcoin, but now looking at lots of other ways to get involved in blockchain. Joining us right now is Bloomberg's Lily Katz. Lily, uh, this, um, 
the conversation about uh, digital currencies sort of starts and stops with Bitcoin, with a lot of people starting to think about blockchain. But what is it about Bitcoin that makes it just so impossible for Wall Street to use it as a currency? You know, there are a lot of things that Wall Street executives have to worry about when, when they're considering whether to start adopting this thing, right? right? I mean, there's fraud. I mean, these banks have regulations. They right. have anti-money laundering regulations. And big banks are seen as a, a, a place where people can safely put their money. And they have a reputation for that. So do they want to risk that reputation by adopting an asset that is seen as a, a risky, volatile asset? And so the very volatility of the asset makes it hard for a bank to maintain its reputation? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also interesting to me that the, the know your customer rules, and I think that a lot of people, even in the digital currency space, don't really understand how sacrosanct it is in the, in the, in the markets, that, that the KYC rules, know your customer, is so important. It's about money laundering and more. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's why we've seen so many executives come out in the last month, right? I mean, we saw Jamie Dimon. He came out and said, Bitcoin's one big fraud. I'm going to fire any trader who trades Bitcoin. We saw Larry Fink come out and, and talk about how Bitcoin. CEO of BlackRock. Is, yes, CEO of BlackRock. Come out and talk about how, how much Bitcoin is used in uh, crimes. We had the, the chairman of UBS come out and say that he's skeptical. Although we did actually have a couple execs come out and talk about, give sort of more balanced views. We had Morgan Stanley's CEO come out and say, you know, this might have some sort of future. I'm not totally convinced that it's. Uh, it's nothing, and, and, we, and Goldman CEO also came out and said, I haven't quite made a decision on it yet. Right. Um, you know, he actually brought up an interesting point, which is that people once viewed paper money as this weird thing. So who's to say that Bitcoin is not you know, the same? Well, and interesting that Lloyd Blankfein comes from a trading part of that business, even before it's part, part of Goldman Sachs, but right. comes from a trading background and maybe understands just the trading nature of it, uh, maybe more than, than, than Jamie Dimon. Yeah. But there's also the aspect that, that Jamie Dimon's business, on some level, is about having lots of fingers in the pie when things go from, when money's moved from one account, you write a check and it goes to another account and it takes three days and there's all kinds of stuff involved and charges that happen in the way that's JP Morgan's business if you trade a stock on a JP Morgan platform it, it it moves from one hand to the next to the next to the next and recording all those transactions is a part of JP Morgan's business if blockchain can take all that away JP Morgan loses all that business right I mean that's when you think about why Bitcoin was created in the first place like it was created to in a way displace these centralized big banks. I mean, why use a big bank if you can just, if I can just give you money instead of going through the bank to give you money? I mean, that, that was the whole point of, of Bitcoin. So it's obviously like smart of these banks to be thinking about this as a potential risk. And if it isn't, you know, we've had some of these ICOs, these initial coin offerings that have created all these new kinds of currencies, very specialty currencies. But Bitcoin is not only getting the headlines, it's getting the trades. I want to show you a chart uh, on the Bloomberg terminal um, uh, that, that shows you sort of this euphoria around Bitcoin. And it really shows you and demonstrates, if you were to go to your Bloomberg terminal and type in G space, hashtag BTV space, 8492, and press the green go key, you get this very same chart right in your own Bloomberg terminal. And you'll see that the only time that Bitcoin has been oversold from a technical basis, it's going all the way back to mid-2015, that there has been this sort of bullish trade, sometimes getting a little kooky up there above that red line. People loving Bitcoin. When, the, when Bitcoin you know, pricing was all the way down there, down to you know, 240 bucks only two years ago, not trading uh, at extreme heights right now, uh, you know, up over 4,000. Um, th this excitement on Bitcoin is about more about Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum starting to get a, a lot of attention as well, but nowhere near as much as Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, more than $2 billion has gone into these initial coin offerings this year, which is pretty wild. Um, it's People are not ignoring this stuff. Um, and... You know, well, well, do, you get a, do you get a sense that, in, in, given that case, that, that there's an excitement about blockchain, that it's sort of focusing on Bitcoin and something else? I mean, the ICOs seem like some of the dumbest investments I could possibly imagine because it's, it's almost like a SPAC, like a special acquisition corp or specialty purpose acquisition corporation where you buy stock on something before the business exists. The same kind of thing is true of these ICOs. Yeah, a lot of people make the distinction between ICOs that are actually raising money for a coin that does something versus you know, these maybe shady cryptocurrency companies right. start by some, started by someone in their basement who are just trying to raise money for themselves. Um, so there, there may is, be some overlap. There may be some overlap, yeah. Lily Katz, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lily Katz, really appreciate your time. All right, thanks a lot.
Well, coming up, Puerto Rico takes to Twitter to uh, ask Tesla for help. How Elon Musk, could he actually help the island torn apart by Hurricane Maria? We're going to talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. Lots of companies are sending lots of supplies to Puerto Rico, including Tesla. Not cars, no, it's solar panels and batteries. Hurricane Maria, of course, knocked out power for 90% of the homes uh, and businesses in Puerto Rico. Uh, supplies already arriving. Puerto Rico's governor, Ricardo Rossello, uh, reached out to uh, Tesla's CEO, Elon Musk, using Twitter. Uh, he's suggesting that Tesla help re rebuild the entire island's grid and they look at more green power. The two spoke today. And hours later, Elon Musk took to social media saying, quote, Tesla's uh, will semi-unveil semi now November 16, diverting resources to fix Model 3 bottlenecks and increase battery production for Puerto Rico and other affected areas. Joining me right now, Bloomberg Business Week, Max Chafkin. Max, you and I just talked about this on Bloomberg Radio, uh, uh, and then Elon comes out with this tweet. This is really interesting because the help to Puerto Rico, and it should be pointed out that Tesla's limited profitability doesn't mean they're getting a lot of tax benefit here, um, that this is a truly a generous effort on the part, behalf of Tesla. But we don't know what they're giving, and yet they're already saying this has something to do with delaying a product that's not even on the market. Well, I think you have to look at this Tesla semi-truck that, that Elon Musk has been talking up this year as kind of a side project. Right. And I think the, the fact is, for Tesla to sort of justify this, this incredible valuation it has, it needs to get Model 3 sedans you know, off the production lines. And so I think that reading into it, reading between the lines, I would say Tesla just can only handle one side project at a time, and Elon Musk has kind of decided Which that... Which side project? That, you know, the, in other words, Puerto Rico versus the... Surprise. Okay, okay, so Tesla itself, because Elon Musk has seen well, a lot Elon of Musk side projects. Can, yeah, Elon Musk can ha handle many side he's projects. He's the king we, of the multitask. As, as we've learned, yeah, he's running two companies, and, you know, just a couple couple days ago, he, he introduced a new rocket. So, so lots happening in, uh, in, in Elon land. So let's talk about this very specifically, the solar power. The, the way that Tesla's uh, solar business works, uh, Solar City, uh, formerly separately... Uh, uh, traded company uh, is to provide power to homeowners, but power that goes back into the grid. Yes, it's not to run power in someone's house in a self-sustained effort, like uh, say some of the companies providing power in Africa, like off-grid electric, so, so that, that, where there aren't grids to be involved. So, and this is a, one of the big reasons, according to Elon Musk, that they merged the companies, because that was true when it came to Solar City. Solar right. City made and installed solar panels, and you needed a, a connection to the grid to make that work. With these batteries, Tesla calls it the power wall. The idea is a homeowner could, if they wanted, to get off-grid. And a couple months back, Elon Musk took to Twitter to say, basically. Basically, he doesn't think that the grid is going to be the long-term way that most people get power, that many homes uh, will, will move off the grid and will just run off of the, their rooftop panels. And so, so that's, the, that's the kind of vision. I think it's important to keep in mind that it's, it's a long way out, and a very long way out. And, and, and to that, I mean, so we've, he's offering a product right now to Puerto Rico, but another way that SolarCity works is they have installers right. who can install solar power. They don't work for SolarCity. Are there installers available to put this stuff to work in, in Puerto Rico? Well, that was another, there was another issue on this uh, Twitter. Some Puerto Ricans were complaining that companies were charging, I think, something like $12,000 for these, to install these power walls where, where it should cost something like five or $6,000, according to Tesla. Elon Musk took to Twitter, said that's, that's a supply issue. I think they're sending, you know, engineers down, down to Puerto Rico. But it gets to this, this, this important point, which is that solar installation is a kind of, it's like a construction business. It's not necessarily like a high profitability industry. And that's what, you know, that's kind of the trick to, to Solar City, to making tes now, now Tesla Energy, to making this work, right. is being able to do this at scale and, 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 and to do lots of it at once. And again, that was another, uh, people question this, but another part of the rationale with Tesla is that they can now sort of package cars and solar panels and batteries all at once. So you're not, you know, having to deal with lots and lots of salespeople or, or all such, sorts of other things that were increasing the cost for Solar City. And, and you know, I think this also points out for the people who get bored when they hear about, you know, bond, municipal debt, Puerto Rico, different issuances, fighting with who owns it. The, the financial situation in Puerto Rico presently 
prevents the, 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 the island from rebuilding a modern infrastructure because they just don't have the money to do it. They don't have the facility that anywhere else in the United States might have. Uh, and, and until that gets resolved, we're not going to see a solar Puerto Rico. We're not going to see a cutting edge power grid, which we might see even coming up in Texas when that gets rebuilt or the parts of Florida that have been affected. I mean, it is what makes this kind of proposal and supposedly the governor of Puerto Rico and, and Elon Musk talked uh, at some point today, according to their tweets, uh, it kind of makes it intriguing because Puerto Rico, something like I think over 80 or 90 percent of their power lines are down right now. I mean, they don't really have a grid at the moment. Right. So, so it is. So they could a, build a new one. It's enticing to think right. of a, a Puerto Rico or, or, or sort of a microcosm of a place without transmission lines where most people are just using you know solar panels right. on their homes and as Elon uh, you know pointed out there are a few islands uh, an island in American Samoa that I think has about 600 people has done this of course Puerto Rico is much much bigger uh, more developed than than American Samoa we're talking 3.5 million people people who want to run air conditionings Look, and fans and TVs all the time the coolest thing about Elon Musk is that he, he makes you start to think about things that aren't possible or haven't been possible before and so wouldn't that be a great thing if we could have a new modern infrastructure for Puerto Rico um, We'll see. I, Max, so much. Uh, Max Chafkin uh, from Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, great stuff, as always. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Corey. All right. Facebook, Twitter, and Google all under the spotlight as lawmakers continue to probe Russia's influence on the election. What changes could be underway for tech giants? We're going to talk about that. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Check me out on the radio. You can listen to the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, Sirius XM Station 119. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump held an event at the White House on Friday to mark Hispanic Heritage Month. That's after coming under fire from Latino leaders who, who say his response to hurricane relief in Puerto Rico was poor. The president predicted the island would come back strong after a long recovery. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders on Friday gave the official White House explanation for President Trump's cryptic message on Thursday night when he called his photo op with military leaders the calm before the storm. He, he certainly doesn't uh, want to lay out his game plan for uh, our enemies. So if you're asking, is the president uh, trying to, you know, do that? Absolutely. In regards to North Korea, Sanders reiterated all options remain on the table. North Korea plans to test a long-range missile that could potentially hit the U.S. That's according to two Russian legislators who just returned from Pyongyang. They said the North wants to show it's ready for confrontation. The missile, which would likely have to travel over Russian territory, could theoretically hit the U.S. west coast. The international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons is the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Executive Director Beatrice Finn told reporters in Geneva that the election of Donald Trump as U.S. president sends a message. There are no right hands for the, for the wrong weapons. Uh, but um, So if you are uncomfortable with the idea of Donald Trump having nuclear weapons that he's able to launch, you're really uncomfortable with nuclear weapons in general. Uh, I think that that's really the, the message that we wanna, want um, to come across. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres tweeted his congratulations. A law enforcement official says Las Vegas shooter Stephen Paddock bought 1,000 rounds of tracer ammunition a month ago. Tracers contain a pyrotechnic charge that illuminates a bullet's path so shooters can correct their aim. Officials have not disclosed if Paddock used tracer rounds during the attack. The United Nations on Friday lowered its flag at its headquarters in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, as its 13-year mission in the country winds down. There are now about 100 international soldiers still in the country, and they will leave within days. The mission's official end date is October 15th. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. This is Bloomberg.
is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson. Well, the House Intelligence Committee is asking officials from Facebook, Twitter, and Google to testify publicly as part of its Russian probe. This will be November 1st, the same day a planned Senate intelligence hearing is scheduled. According to two people familiar with the decision, Bloomberg Technology's Brad Stone sat down with Tom Giles and Bloomberg News' Eric Newcomer to talk about that and other top tech stories of the week. He started by asking, asking if tech companies can expect more regulation. It's a very real possibility. Remember, our colleague Sarah Fryer reported this week about how Facebook lobbied for years with the FEC in Washington, D.C. to keep from having to have their, their political ad spending regulated the way it is on TV, radio, and print. Their argument was, look, the space is too small. There's not enough, there's not enough characters for you to add all those disclaimers that you have on, ra on radio and TV. Um, now the poss there is a very real possibility that legislators could come in, force regulators to impose some, some limits on this. And that could sort of slow up the trickle of money, revenue, into uh, Facebook's coffers. Eric, it was remarkable to me that Facebook and Twitter seem like punching bags all week. And right. Facebook, uh, this week, the stock was actually up. Why doesn't Wall Street care about this, and, and should they? Right, I think it's like a $498 billion market cap. Um, it's amazing. I mean, we saw the Trump bump after the election. I think overall the stock market has been pretty sort of bullish and hasn't been so worried, hasn't been particularly responsive to these Russia concerns or North Korea or much, much reaction there. Um, I also think from Facebook's perspective, there's always going to be the fact that anything Facebook's held accountable for, it's probably going to be reflective that the situation was far worse in terms of the government's handling and intelligence agencies' handling of any sort of election hacking. So I think they're always going to be sort of the second player there. And so there'll be a level of political cover for them if the situation gets worse. And I think that's got to reassure people that Facebook won't take the biggest hit here. Okay, Tom, let's talk about Amazon. Our colleague Spencer Sopa reported of a new program called Seller Flex. Amazon will be uh, basically picking products up in the warehouses of its suppliers and distributing them directly to customers. How worried should UPS and FedEx be? I think in the near term, not a lot of cause for concern. You saw those stocks take a tick down, one or two ticks down. Longer term, you know as well as anybody, uh, Brad, that Amazon likes to experiment and iterate, and they are they would they love spending money on warehouses and their their network. The fact is, if you see them down the if they start to see success on a limited basis where these trials take place, there's nothing stopping them from expanding their network. But in the near term, those networks cost billions of dollars. FedEx and UPS are very well established. They're in place. They have their trucks. They have everything in place. I don't think it's something that affects them in the very, very near term. Yeah, I agree with that, right? I mean, e-commerce and Amazon in particular is such a growing market. Uh, Amazon's looking, looking for ways to fulfill all that demand. And obviously, this is going to be one piece to their supply chain. But Eric, let's talk about Uber because, of course, you know, it's not a week in Silicon Valley if right. there isn't more Uber drama. Yes. So, the word unanimous was remarkable in that board meeting earlier in this week where they unanimously voted the board to move ahead with the SoftBank investment, right? So is this the end to this fractiousness on the Uber board? Well, that was sort of the whole goal of this deal. It was governance plus SoftBank. And the idea was how can we put all these pieces together to bring everybody, everybody's getting something. I think there was also a lot of negotiation down to the wire, literally like day of, night of, People were fighting about what would exactly would go into this. And I mean, one of the central points of debate was how much to crack down on Travis's role at the company going forward. I think the original messages like basically target him, were very clear they were about him. And then some of the language changed to make it still restrictive of his future role, but less sort of mean spirited. And I think that was able to bring everybody together, even though, you know, there 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 were still things people didn't like about it there was enough agreement to sort of get the board. What does that extra billion or a billion point two five in the bank mean for Uber going forward? Well, there's a level of optics. I mean, Uber still has a fair bit in the bank. It's, you know, new money is useful, but the important part of the deal is the secondary, which could be still in the range of nine billion. Basically what's happening right now is SoftBank and its investors with Dragoneer want 14 to 17% of outstanding shares. That's going to be the much bigger check. That's like $9 billion. It depends on the valuation, which could be around 50 You know, the number is sort of a moving target. But the, the direct is good for the company, but it's much smaller than the much larger secondary investment that's going to happen here. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Brad Stone, Tom Giles, and Eric Newcomer.
Well, the meal kit startup HelloFresh could announce an IPO in just a few weeks, according to people familiar with the matter. To distance itself from Blue Aprons, recently a face-planted IPO, HelloFresh is, will show investors preliminary third quarter results before the quarter's over. HelloFresh owned by Germany's Rocket Internet. We'll stay with IPOs, a data center company Switch raised uh, sorry, $531 million in the third biggest tech IPO of the year. Shares trading on the New York Stock Exchange jumped 21% over the offering price. Switch designs, builds, and operates data centers. And get this, even though it's a tech startup, the company's been profitable. Yes, profitable for the past four years. Well, coming up, here's an idea. Get rid of the resume and you get rid of bias. We're going to explore a resume-free world and a, a fight discrimination at the same time next. And this week on Bloomberg Television, we're bringing the best interviews in the week, including all the highlights from the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in L.A., Disney's Bob Iger, LinkedIn's Reid Hoffman, and the Dallas Mavericks' Mark Cuban, all. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg. City for our viewers worldwide. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. How mindful are you of the possibility of what the markets talk about as a trade war? We've been in a trade war for decades. The next two years are going to be very uncertain. So you have Brexit uncertainty. To use your word, you have Trumponomics uncertainty. They have been front and center in selling assets to help their debt, but now it's going to be about growth. show we talked about the strange hurricane scarred September jobs report the hurricanes couldn't slow down growth in technology but competition for these jobs is intense interviewing.io helps companies find the engineers they're looking for but has a unique process to remove bias from the interviewing process scrapping resumes altogether joining right now is Aileen Lerner she's the founder of interviewing.io so Aileen thank you very much for joining us first of all tell me about how your approach uh, is so very different than what we see in a typical job sites. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. So uh, what we do is very different than the typical uh, hiring process because we're trying to entirely get rid of resumes. So the idea is that a resume doesn't really have much information about whether somebody can do the job and this is doubly true for software engineering roles. Uh, in this climate, uh, there are so many people that are going outside of the traditional uh, four-year degree and the traditional system to learn to code uh, more and more every year. And uh, the way that companies filter people right now is just not cognizant of that. Also, uh, you know, well, everybody explain, knows. Explain it to me. So, so the notion that you look at a resume, it seems to be that a resume, you're not, you don't see the person in front of you. You don't have any notion of whether they're black, white, red, or green. You may know if it's male or female. You can see a little bit about where they're from. Those seem like useful things in a, in a, to understand what someone might bring to the table. Yeah, uh, I mean they're they're not entirely useless, but uh, we've I've done a few studies uh, that have really kind of made me doubt the efficacy of resumes. I can tell you about one or two of them. So uh, before I started interviewing IO, I used to run hiring at a company called TrialPay, where we interviewed hundreds of engineering candidates, and we looked at everybody that we interviewed and who got offers, and then we looked at their resumes and tried to see if there were any signals on these resumes that could actually tell us something about what we should look for. And what we found really really surprised. Uh, what ended up mattering more than anything, more than where people went to school, more than where they worked in the past, more than their GPA, their years of experience, was how many typos and grammatical errors they actually had. That was by far the number one strongest thing. I, so that, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's amazing. You see, I can't, whenever I'm looking to hire somebody, I cannot believe how many typos I see in a resume. But And there, there are a lot. Um, but, you know, that that's for... Uh, an industry where you know you'd think that studying computer science at a top school would actually make a difference, uh, you know, it was very very surprising and, and something that really got me scratching my head. So then I did another thing where I looked at a bunch of resumes and actually anonymized them. So I took off all identifying biographical details, uh, where people. Um, were from potentially, uh, you know, their names, of course. And then I showed those resumes to a bunch of recruiters and engineers and hiring managers and just said, answer this one question. Would you actually want to interview this person? And the crazy thing was not only could 
any of these people, not tell who was actually good, but they all disagreed with each other. So nobody could even come to a consensus about what a good candidate looked like in the first place. So, um, so, so what is a so when you do a video interview, what kind of questions will you ask a person in terms of of, of uh, give them a way to present themselves uh, in a way that sort of shows who they are without being you know un uninformative. Yeah, so we actually, uh, we don't do videos. Uh, the reason for that, and I know this sounds totally crazy, but, but bear with me. Uh, the reason for that is that everything that happens on interviewing IO is completely anonymous. So we're really bought into this idea that what somebody can do should matter way more than how they look on paper or who they are or where they're from. So uh, every in uh, interview on the platform is essentially the kind of technical interview that you might see at a company like Google or Facebook. And in fact, a lot of the interviewers on our platform are engineers that work at those two companies as well as uh, some other uh, very well regarded companies that you've probably heard of like Dropbox, Airbnb and so forth. So what happens on our platform is somebody shows up and they just get matched with uh, an interviewer and they jump right in and start solving problems together. So the interviewer is going to be asking this person to solve a problem by writing code and then they'll be watching and um, offering hints as needed. Now they have no context about the person they're talking to um, except uh, you know if it's a practice interview no context at all if it's an interview with one of our customers then they'll know that that person has done well in previous practice interviews and that's all that matters so everything is essentially off the table except whether this person can solve problems with code, code which is what so, software engineers do all day except they've also got to be able to talk they've also got to be able to share ideas they've also got to be able to communicate um, as Absolutely. you mentioned they may, might be good if they could spell uh, so, so those Definitely. kinds of things, those kinds of interpersonal skills, how do you get around that hurdle? Yeah, uh, so one of the uh, items on our rubric, so after each interview there's a standardized rubric that all interviewers fill out and we ask things like, how was this person's technical ability, how was their problem solving ability, and how was their communication ability? And then all of these items get bundled up into a weighted average that in turn gets adjusted for different interviewer strictnesses. So communication ability is kind of a critical part of that and in fact a lot of the companies that we work with are startups where um, having product sense, having the ability to figure out what's important, having the ability to work in a team, um, being able to communicate effectively and not just be siloed off as an engineer in a cubicle, but you know, um, be uh, a meaningful contributor to the roadmap of the product. Like These are things that matter and these are things that are kind of implicitly captured in the process. Um, interviewers are generally pretty well tuned to these things as well because they're used to hiring themselves and they, they care about these uh, just as much as our customers do. So uh, you know, by the time a person uh, has done a few interviews on our platform, we have a pretty good idea of what they can do not just in terms of writing code but in terms of their viability as an employee. Eileen Lerner, thank you very much. Eileen Lerner is the founder of interviewing.io. Well coming up, the iPhone 8 just arrived in stores and already some problems perhaps. We're explaining the issue and I've Apple's response next. And a feature we'd like to bring to your attention an interactive TV function. You can find a TV Go on the Bloomberg just watch this live. You can miss an interview. Just go back and watch the rest of it. You can send producers a message and play with the charts. We bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out. Hit TV. Hit the green button. Go. You'll see it on your screen. This is Bloomberg. Was a new top lawyer at Apple. The tech giants appointed Catherine Adams to its general as its general counsel. Bruce Sewell is out, retiring at the end of the year. Adams was previously at Honeywell. Among the cases she'll take on at Apple, a clash with the European Union over a $15 billion tax bill, an ongoing legal conflict with Samsung over intellectual property, and of course, the big battle with Qualcomm. There have been a few reports on social media postings about problems with the iPhone 8, specifically batteries expanding and cracking phone casings. Apple said it's investigating the issue, but they haven't commented any further. Of course, there's a history with that. For more on that, let's go to Mark Gurman in Los Angeles, who covers all things Apple for Bloomberg Tech. And Mark, 
uh, we, you know, uh, this brings back so many memories of iPhones where there's all kinds of uproar about the first iPhones and big problems, none of which thus far have proven to be really big problems. I'm thinking back to the iPhone antenna. I think it was maybe the iPhone 4, maybe, maybe the 3 that had an yeah. antenna that wrapped around the phone. Right. And if, if you touched a key to it in a certain way, maybe it didn't work. Then the most, then the more recent yeah, phones that supposedly were bending or couldn't bend or something. Yeah, that's right. That's with the iPhone 4. They had the whole antenna gate situation back in 2010. That's sort of, Apple sort of had a similar approach where it was saying there's a problem, there's not a problem. They put out some software updates and then Steve Jobs, the CEO at the time, had to end up having a press conference where they decided to just give out free cases for everyone with an iPhone 4. There were these bending issues with the iPhone 6 Plus back in 2014, early 2015. None of those really hurt the iPhone. They came out with new models, not really a problem. But I think a lot of people are anxious about this supposed battery expansion issue with this iPhone 8 because everyone saw what happened with Samsung and their exploding battery situation. The batteries become this sensitive topic. All in all, I honestly, I don't think this is a big deal. I think this is one that's going to blow over in a few days. It's not like these things are exploding. And, and the amount of reports we've seen on this is very few. I haven't seen more blow over? than a handful of these. Really? You're going with blow over? That's, that's going to be your metaphor in this one, blow over? Not blow up, oh, just to I be clear. I didn't even think of this. But I, I, I don't think it's going to blow up. I uh, really don't. And if, well, if I'm wrong, we will, I'm sure we'll be on here a lot more talking about it. <laughs> well, no kidding. But uh, you know, I, I think that it, it highlights this notion that the, the, deal, the issue with the batteries and the, the technology behind the batteries is extraordinarily difficult, and the materials are extraordinarily volatile. And there have been issues with heat issues in particular with Apple products, with Apple laptops uh, going back many years. It was a, was a serious issue for Apple and, and maybe hurt sales of, of one whole round of, of MacBooks. Yeah, battery is one component that Apple really does not have much control over. They're able to customize the parts a bit, but you see they're increasingly going completely in-house for other components like the processors. They're doing more with screens and cameras. You see with the facial recognition sensor on the iPhone. But battery is that commodity component that makes up most of the volume inside the phone. And it's really in other people's hands to test the batteries, to do the chemistry that goes into the creation of these iPhone batteries. And there's been a lot of talk about, hmm, is Apple going to buy Tesla? And one of the things that I've been thinking about this is that Tesla has so much battery experience with the Gigafactory. And, you know, sorry to veer off course here, but, you know, that could bring a lot of in-house experience if Apple were to acquire a company or do a deal with someone that can bring more battery tech in-house. So uh, the, the other question for me is, is sort of where are these reports coming from? And there's so much garbage, quote unquote, reporting about Apple products writ large, both before they come out and after they come out. Are these sources at all uh, places we believe? Is there social media stuff that gives us any hint that this might actually be true? I mean, there's very few tweets and posts on, you know, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter and Facebook. I haven't seen anything that has let, let this spiral out of control. The thing with the antenna gate situation is that anyone who had an iPhone 4, and they sold, I think, one and a half, 1.7 million in the opening weekend back in 2010. So that's nearly... 2 million people who could just take another phone and record themselves reproducing the problem. Now, the Samsung situation with the batteries exploding, that was a tangible issue too, where you saw people shooting videos of Jeeps exploding and catching on fire because the Samsung's in there. You saw pictures of people holding up an exploding phone, people with burn situations, lots of local media reports. We haven't seen anything widespread or all over the place with this iPhone issue, which leads me to believe that, again, the pun is going to blow over uh, in just a few days. In terms of Apple's comment, they don't seem too worried about it either. All they've said is they're looking into it, which basically means they haven't found a problem with it. They're not recognizing there to be an issue. Maybe down the road, they'll issue a very small replacement program uh, for some of the iPhones that they might have found some battery issues with. I'm sure they're investigating it. And I think if it continues right. to escalate, something we see more reports on it, we'll see more from them. Well, let's hope no one gets hurt, Mark Gurman. I hope you don't get hurt either. I hope you don't get hurt. I, Mark, that is so sweet. What a guy that marker. Marker is the best. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All next week, we'll be broadcasting live from the GeekWire Summit in Seattle. Speaking to Yaquin Zhang of Baidu, Starbucks' Kevin Johnson, and Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon Web Services. And don't make exclusive interviews all next week right here on Bloomberg Television. This is Bloomberg.